Hi, welcome to vlog 2, Skills versus Capacities in Speed and Agility. The following vlog will analyse both a speed and an agility drill and highlight an example of both a skill and a capacity limitation for each. The athletes used in this vlog are under 16 rugby players who attend a strength and conditioning session on a weekly basis. The coach kindly included some sprint and agility drills into one of his sessions in order to allow me to film and analyse the movements. Consent was received from all individuals and their parents prior to filming. So firstly, looking at speed, if we watch the player closest to the camera, we can pick up a few key points that highlight an example of a skill limitation. If we slow it down here, we can make note of the point where his foot first makes contact with the ground. It's suggested that the greater the touchdown distance from the centre of gravity, the greater the uh, braking forces are going to be, which leads to an increased ground contact time, meaning it takes longer for the centre of mass to pass the point of contact and be in a position ready to produce horizontal force. And this has been suggested to be the key factor in sprint performance. As we can see with this subject, there's a relatively large touchdown distance from his centre of gravity. So if he was to fully extend his leg now in this position, we can see the angle of his torso is relatively upright, which would mean a, a more vertical rather than horizontal force would be applied. As we can see in slow motion here, now his centre of gravity has quite a distance to travel before it gets into a more horizontal position to apply the force and take off in a better position. If he was able to reduce this touchdown distance from his centre of mass, it would mean less time would be needed um, in order to get into that horizontal position for takeoff. So one drill that can help with this skill issue is demonstrated here, where the athletes are cued to try and pull back the foot to land directly underneath their centre of gravity rather than out in front of them. So if we watch him again here after completing this drill, we can see that his uh, touchdown distance has already reduced um, in relation to his centre of gravity, suggesting that this coaching cue has been quite effective for him. Now if we look at the subject furthest away from the camera here, we can see an example of a capacity limitation. So as we slow it right down, we can see that actually he has a relatively small touchdown distance, which demonstrates good technique and skill. However, if you look at the position of his foot at landing, we can see that he collapses right into his heel and this is apparent on both feet but slightly worse on his left side. This suggests a capacity limitation particularly in terms of Achilles tendon stiffness and its ability to act like a spring and utilise the storage of elastic energy. As the velocity of the contraction increases, the force that's able to be produced in the following propulsive phase of the movement decreases. In this example here, the subject demonstrates an inability to resist negative vertical velocity and the result of this is an increase in braking force, which slows the movement down as well as limits the horizontal force that can be applied to each following stride. So we have to consider that an element of genetics can play a role here in terms of uh, tendon stiffness and muscular contraction speed and there are ways that you could help an athlete to improve a capacity limitation by working on other technical factors to improve the skill. However, in this instance, the weakness of the tricep surrey complex is highlighted further when the subjects were asked to perform these bilateral jumps over a set of hurdles. Again, we can see and even hear how he lands very heavy on his feet and he's unable to resist that negative um, horizontal force, um, meaning he has to compensate with other muscles such as his hip flexors and you can see how high he has to pull his knees up in order to um, facilitate the following jump, uh, which is a very inefficient movement strategy. So this athlete would benefit from some strengthening work in order to help increase his tendon stiffness and build his capacity to resist that negative uh, vertical velocity during uh, sprinting. This uh, exercise is an example of an isometric hold, which would help him to start with and this could later be progressed with some concentric and eccentric loading, uh, followed by some plyometric work, such as hopping and bounding. So now looking at agility, it's important to consider that with this type of activity, um, skills and capacities are strongly interlinked. It can be difficult to determine exclusively one way or the other if the limiting factor is solely skill-based um, or capacity-based without extensive testing, which I was unable to complete in this instance, but I will now give theoretical scenarios for each. For this drill, players were instructed to sprint to the first cone, change the direction, and then run through the middle of the set of cones nearest the camera. 
and as we can see here, this subject did not complete the task efficiently. If we have a look very closely, it could be suggested that this was down to a skill limitation. If we watch slowly as he approaches the cone, he lands with quite high velocity on his left heel, meaning that he's not able to resist the vertical braking force um, and utilise the storage of elastic energy to produce high propulsive force in the next step, which is similar to what we saw in the sprinting athlete. However, when we look at his ability during the two-footed hurdle jumps, we can see that he does appear to have the adequate strength in the ankle plantar flexors um, in order to store and use elastic energy efficiently. But if we go back and watch his following step as he attempts to change his body position, we can see that he does not allow uh, his hips to turn and face the direction that he wants to travel in, and he fails to perform a crossover step which would help him accelerate in the new direction that he needs to go. As a result of this, he then misses his target. Whilst in some cases it could be that a muscular weakness of either the ankle plantar flexors and or the hip flexors could be causing an inability to make effective use of the Achilles tendon as a spring, which would help him accelerate more explosively in this second step. Um, another explanation could be that he needs to develop the muscle patterning to actually keep fast on his toes and drive the knee over and across in order to rotate his hips in the direction he wants to travel. One drill to help with this fast feet high knee approach is shown here where the athletes are asked to perform three uh, footsteps and then a slight pause while uh, driving the knee high and as we can see here he doesn't quite get his knees up particularly high so some individual work with him to achieve that would probably be beneficial in this circumstance. So now if we take a look at the following subject we can see that as he lands on his right leg um, he absorbs the vertical force a bit better and is able to get his hips round and then accelerate in the direction that he needs to. But if we look at his body position in that acceleration phase, we can see that he's very vertical. And if we look back at his straight line sprinting drill, we can see this uh, more clearly. So because we can see here that he's also adopted this more upright posture during the speed work, it suggests that this is currently his selected movement strategy during acceleration regardless of the direction he's travelling in and this is not optimal. With the goal being to improve the angle of forward lean in order to maximise the horizontal force that's produced during acceleration, we need to consider that although we can coach it with cues to stay low or lean forward, the angle of the forward lean can only progress alongside strength levels of the posterior chain. So even though it's not exclusively clear in this instance if weakness is solely the reason for his limited angle of forward lean, he would benefit from increasing his strength capacity in his core and hip extensors such as the glutes and hamstrings, so that when he's coached to stay low or lean forward, he has built up the capacity in order to allow him to do so. So one exercise that would be particularly beneficial to improve this is a resisted Romanian deadlift, which looks to improve eccentric loading capabilities of the glutes and hamstrings, uh, which would not only improve his explosive strength whilst he's in that uh, forward flex position, but also help him prevent any hamstring injuries during acceleration. So, in summary, we can see how in sprint and agility work, skills and capacities are very closely linked. It's important to analyse where the movement seems to be breaking down and rationalise this from both a skills and capacities approach to get the most efficient outcome for the subject and then use both movement specific drills and strengthening work alongside one another to allow the required improvements in the performance to be made.